Phil, can you see this? You want lights out or not? Just up to you guys. Going right now? Okay, cool. Yeah, well, this is a, it's a very good projector. So thank you, technical team. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here and for inviting me. Um, my name is Joanna Tong, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm a PhD candidate, a grad student at UC Santa Barbara. So a little bit of more from y'all. Um, a little background about me. I, uh, I grew up in the Bay Area, so I had the Baylands as my playground. Woo, yeah. And uh, very, very privileged to be able to just explore nature um, out there and uh, always had a garden in our backyard and just loved being out in nature and the plants. So I went to UC Davis for undergrad uh, studying environmental science and management, um, but with kind of a focus in plant ecology. And uh, from, from there, I um, really got interested in uh, restoration ecology as well. And so I worked for a couple uh, kind of grassroots NGO um, restoration organizations after I graduated from uh, undergrad, but I always wanted to go to grad school, um, but not on academia track. So I wanted to go to grad school to get some research experience, but I really want to be a habitat restoration practitioner or like a land manager. Um, and this is actually my last year as a PhD student. And I am uh, opening an office in Santa Barbara uh, for doing um, restoration consulting work. Uh, so if you all have any projects or want to collaborate, uh, let me know because I'm actively looking for proposals to be able to start working on habitat restoration in um, Southern California. So please, please do let me know. Um, oh. And um, so a little bit more kind of intro to my research. Um, again, I'm a plant ecologist, so I love um, habitat restoration. I love being outside. And I love gardening as well. Um, and my mom also loves gardening. So we have food garden, we have flower gardens, and we have native gardens. My parents most recently installed a pear labyrinth with a lot of native plants kind of um, in, in, in the middle of it. I'm also very passionate about science communication, which is why I love um, coming and talking to um, community members and other scientists, other researchers, um, anyone who loves plants. And so, um, I know we have kind of about an hour here. Um, and so I have some slides um, that I can show you kind of what my research is about and what my motivation for working with plants and working with habitat restoration is. Uh, but do feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions, um, especially if you wanna know a plant name or anything um, that's on the screen, uh, just raise your hand and we can kind of meander through this, uh, this discussion. It can be more of a discussion, um, less of a talk. Um, uh, so, but first, I actually want to ask you all some questions. Uh, so, to kind of get get the room, uh, get a feel of the room. Who uh, who went on that great vernal pool tour with uh, Tony? Yes, awesome. And who has been to a vernal pool before today? Okay, oh, awesome. Great, great, great. Uh, who has a garden at home that they're gardening? In? Awesome, awesome. Who has native plants in their garden? Awesome. Okay, 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 great, great. I love this crowd. I love this crowd. And uh, who has uh, engaged in research before? I've done like an experiment. Okay, okay. I think actually, I think everybody who raised their hand and said they have a garden, uh, I think you've also done research. <laughs> I've done an experiment. And so that's kind of uh, one motivation I have is uh, one reason for going to grad school, even though I'm not, um, I don't want to be a professional researcher. Uh, my motto is that I hope I want every experiment I do to be an active restoration project. So I'm not just doing science for science sake, uh, I'm doing applied science. And so I'm thinking of solutions uh, for addressing problems in restoration. And my hope is also that every restoration project or every garden project can be designed so that you can actually get experimental results from it. Uh, because I think that is a really, uh, really what we need right now when we're thinking about how can we improve habitat restoration is there's a lot of knowledge. You all have a bunch of knowledge about where native plants grow, how they grow, how you can really foster uh, native habitat, but it's just all in your brain. And usually even if we're land managers, like Tony has so much knowledge in his brain um, that we're trying to extract out. And uh, what we really want to do, what, what I'm really interested in is 
Um, one, improving the documentation. So making sure I'm writing down all the things that I'm discovering and sharing them with you all and other people. And also other forms of science communication and really increasing collaboration, which is again, why I love coming a little bit outside of my bubble of Santa Barbara, coming talking to you. Um, I'm also going to uh, the uh, California Biodiversity Network gathering, um, the 30 by 30 gathering. Has anybody heard of California Biodiversity Network? It's a little bit more um, of a uh, more professional um, like restoration people, but they're all working towards the 30 by 30 goal that Biden has challenged us of conserving 30% of the nation's land by 2030. And their, um, the, the California Biodiversity Network, their motto is really that the way we're going to do that is by collaborating with each other and sharing ideas. And so a lot of people from across the state are coming, are going down to Riverside next week to share ideas. Um, so I encourage you to um, engage in those kind of spaces as well. Um, but really, really happy um, to be a part of um, CNPS as well. Um, I went to their conference uh, last year, um, I think, and um, love their plant cells. And I've been to a lot of other Zoom, um, a lot of other Zoom uh, casted meetings and things like that. Yeah, so that's a little bit of my motivation about um, why I do what I do. So now I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, but before I tell you exactly what I do, I do want to tell you um, or show you kind of who I work with. Um, I just wanted to list out a bunch of people that I work with a lot of my lab uh, members. So I'm in Dr. Carla D'Antonio's vegetation ecology lab. And also a lot of, um, so we work with the, so I'm at, at UC Santa Barbara. And Santa Barbara has uh, this uh, Cheeto Center of Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration. And they're kind of the mitigation arm of the university. So any like campus expansion that they have to do um, that destroys native habitat, they have to mitigate for that. And so um, the Cheeto Center is in charge of restoration. So I collaborate with them a lot. And then there's a lot of community members that have just seen me chomping around in the field. They're like, what are you doing? And I recruit them to help me. Um, and I have a lot of student helpers as well who, who come and um, help me with my work. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that all of the work that I do is done on the ancestral unceded territory of the Chumash tribe. And so I'm uh, very much indebted to them about their, um, how they stewarded the land previously. And I'm really trying to connect with them because you'll see later on in my, in my talk or in my slides that um, I really want to bring back that kind of stewardship from um, indigenous practices um, back into the landscape. Okay, so what am I doing with all of these people? Um, so I work on, I, I call myself an urban ecologist. Um, and so I work in spaces uh, that are in cities um, and in, in college campuses, especially around UC Santa Barbara, uh, because I really think of restoration as, um, uh, like rest because I said I've, I've grown up gardening um, and then kind of trans transitioned into restoration but I see the lines between horticulture and, and landscape architecture and um, even agriculture and restoration um, there those lines can blur a little bit and so I am really interested in looking at well what what green spaces do we have in our cities and how can we view them as not just like green spaces parks um, like real estate often, um, but how can we see them as native habitat and what can we do with them? And so in particular, I work on vernal pool wetlands. Um, so I know a lot of you are familiar with vernal pools. It's very exciting. It's so cool to see the vernal pool here, but I'll give you uh, a little intro on what um, uh, my definition of a vernal pool and what vernal pools look like to me. So California's vernal pools are seasonally flooded, um, rain-fed wetlands. And so they're only, they're temporary wetlands. So vernal means temporary or springtime. And so during um, California's climate, uh, these, these pools are only, only form when we have our winter rains. And there's a subsurface um, impermeable, like a hard pan or a clay pan underneath um, the, underneath the soil that you see. And that, like uh, that hard pan, that clay pan uh, is impermeable to water. And so when you have dips in the landscape and you have water falling, th that water falls and then forms a pool because it can't sink down into the groundwater. So that's why these pools are completely rain fed. 
And then uh, when the, we get a combination during the springtime of wetness and sunshine, that's when we get really beautiful displays of uh, flora and fauna that grow and reproduce really, really quickly uh, before the pools completely dry out during the summer. So again, our temporary wetlands. And so you have this very highly dynamic environment where you have a lot of, um, you have a short time where you can actually grow and reproduce um, really quickly. And you can think of it like you're living half your life underwater and half your life with zero water. So there's only a very specific um, amount of species that have special characteristics that, that can allow them to withstand this kind of uh, wetting and drying. So if we go back to the picture, pretty picture of what it looks like in springtime, we can take a closer look and look at some of the um, native species that we find in vernal pools. And actually, um, almost uh, a, a lot of a lot of species that you find in vernal pools are only found in vernal pools. You can't find them anywhere else. So we have species like a popcorn flower, um, super cute. So that's my hand there, and my, I've, I'm a small person and I have tiny hands. So those are tiny, tiny flowers. Um, so your popcorn flower, we have dwarf woolly heads. Um, which we saw um, in the pool here. And then we have Aryngium basei, um, peyote thistle. Um, and all these uh, really can withstand a lot of inundation. Um, so they're kind of in the center of the pool. And then we have some species like uh, Dunningia cuspidata. Um, I don't think it has a, a, a common name, but it's just a Dunningia. It's a beautiful purple, uh, little purple species. And this is my favorite native plant. Um, this is Cascalea densiflora. Um, sorry, this is Alice clover. Um, and it has this really beautiful purple display. And so those kind of withstand a moderate amounts of inundation um, closer to the edges of the pool. And then even farther on the edges, you have butter and eggs. Like this is why vernal pools are the best is because the names are the best. So that's butter and eggs. Um, we have meadow foam for Nancy's. And then we have tidy tips, super cute. Um, uh, lay a pie blossom around, around the edges. And so you get these concentric circles of uh, flowers that kind of ring around the vernal pools. And that's where you can see you have this really amazing like mini ecosystem where you have all this variation. All of these plants, uh, again, can only be found in vernal pools and they all have special adaptations. Like for example, the Eryngium, uh, the coyote thistle, the Eryngium basei, it uh, has, uh, its leaves are dimorphous, so they change. And so when these guys germinate underwater, they their leaves are straight up and they're actually like curled over and they just like shoot up above the water. So they're literally just straws, bringing in oxygen to the plant's roots. And then once the pool dries out, their leaves actually splay out and then it um, comes, a little hard to see in this picture, but they come, they come out into these prickly, um, thistle leaves. Um, so that's like one adaptation. And then we have the a lot of these uh, plant species um, living in the pool and we also have animals that can live in this highly dynamic environment. Uh, so we have fairy shrimp, which are super, super cool. Uh, that is actually a riverside fairy shrimp that I, I saw this year. It was amazing. Um, and we have uh, tadpole shrimp. I mean, these are basically like aliens. They're so cool. <laughs> and then we, of course, have our adorable little California tiger salamander. Like, you can't get any cuter than that. So they're super, super cool animals. And again, these all grow and reproduce. They have a wet phase and then they have a dry phase. So um, in the case of these invertebrates, they, uh, they grow and reproduce in just a couple of months. And then they lay their eggs um, as cysts. And these cysts have really strong, uh, sorry, really thick coats. And so they fall to the bottom of the pool. The pool dries out, it's fine. And then it's like, just add water. And then the, the, their eggs come, come to life. And there's some in the vernal pool. California tiger salamander has a, um, a, wet, a swimming phase and then it morph, metamorphoses into our salamander, um, like frogs who are also tadpoles and Pacific tree frogs in vernal pools. So there are all these amazing species in vernal pools. And as I'm like crumbling around in uh, at Davis and then at Santa Barbara, well, mainly at Davis and looking at all these awesome species, um, it's just really, really cool to see all these special native species. But not only are these species um, specialized in vernal pools, 
they're also endangered. Um, and so they're actually slowly disappearing. And that's because uh, vernal pools themselves are slowly disappearing. Um, so only 5% of historical vernal pool habitat still exists today, which is why you all are so lucky to have one in uh, Madonna Marsh. If you, if you didn't go on the tour, then you have to just go out um, on Madonna Marsh tomorrow and see the vernal pool. Because um, especially in LA, um, there are there's only a handful um, left. Um, the vernal pools uh, often exist in kind of these like grassland landscapes, which are flat places, fertile land, um, aka agricultural land. So <laughs> they're very easily developed, um, um, also aka college campuses. Um, so UC Santa Barbara is still at the top vernal pool habitat, which is very susceptible to any development. And so um, UC Santa Barbara, um, so, so around Santa Barbara, there's actually um, very, very few. So in SoCal specifically, there is probably close to only 3% of vernal pools left um, and even less in Santa Barbara. So uh, fortunately, Santa Barbara has recognized that they um, built a top vernal pool habitat, um, which is why they have uh, the Cheadle Center. So if we zoom in, we can see what's going on here. UC Santa Barbara is, is literally right here. This is part of campus right here. And uh, so I mentioned the Cheadle Center is a, the restoration arm of the university. So any um, any campus expansion that happens, uh, they do restoration. And a lot of the restoration involves vernal pools, which are highlighted in blue here, uh, because again, it, that, that's what was historically there. And so you can see with these highlighted blue parcels, they're really tucked in, like these ones are on campus. They're tucked amidst dorm dormitories. This huge, this is Isla Vista, a huge residential area. And then we do have some uh, wider open spaces, not a, a city open space over there um, that has, has some vernal pools on it. Uh, but in general, this is why I think of myself as an urban ecologist, because these really are urban ecosystems. They're tucked in these urban um, places, uh, much like uh, your backyard or my backyard. Um, so full disclosure, this is not my backyard. I'm just <laughs> that out but this is a backyard in uh, Santa Barbara. And some people might look at um, urban um, urban systems and say, like, well, not worth it to do restoration. So look at it. Uh, you have this hard pan, this concrete, uh, this very hard layer that you can't draw anything on. You probably have to do a lot of work to get anything to grow there. And you have these small parcel sizes. So um, there's just these tiny units that um, may not, uh, you may not be able to grow anything there. And so a lot of people um, can kind of like relegate uh, urban restoration to just like greening projects or something like that. Or they're like, you'll never, you'll never be able to, they look at this like, you'll never be able to grow a forest there. And I'm like, okay, you, yes, you cannot grow a forest there, but the forest is not the only ecosystem out there. And um, I actually argue that vernal pools are really, really good candidates for urban restoration, aka your backyard. So <laughs> because um, they actually are these like little mini like packaged ecosystems um, that really just need a little bit of space. And they actually uh, like they don't necessarily need a, a vast amount of connectivity. So you think of like wildlife corridors and things like that. Um, it's really nice to have like swaths of vernal pools, but you can have just individual vernal pools that itself is just a self-contained ecosystem. And I actually found uh, that when I was doing surveys, uh, vegetation surveys of those those blue vernal pools that I highlighted around campus, um, that there is actually um, high native cover in actually the parcel sizes that are smaller. So in the in the Parcel sizes that were like right in campus or right surrounded by dorms, those pools actually got higher neighbor cover than the ones that were in larger parcels, like that huge open space. Um, largely because the huge open space um, was not necessarily a restored space. It was actually uh, mainly, mainly invaded by non-native grasses and they only restored the vernal pool. And so vernal pools are very threatened by invasive species. And so actually when, uh, when you eliminate that like buffer um, of those non-native grasses and you have vernal pools butted right up against um, dorms, dorms don't are not hospitable to invasive grasses either. And so you eliminate that threat of, of invasive species. So that's, that's one hypothesis I have for why there's actually higher native cover in the smaller partial sizes. 
So I really challenge us to think of, oh, sorry, so just, yeah, my story, we're gonna pull out how to hire to cover um, in smaller parcels. Um, and so because of this, I really challenge us to not see those characteristics as challenges, but actually as opportunities. So right, we're not gonna make a forest in these little spaces, but um, we can look for opportunities for doing some habitat restoration, introducing native plants in here. Um, and so the background, again, this is one of the restoration projects where that's actually faculty housing in the background and a vernal pool right right there um, in, in the foreground. So was yeah. that historically a vernal pool or is this, we, we decided we're going to put, this is a good spot for it's a good question. And how do you make that decision? It's a good Can question. Can you repeat the question? So that yes, know. yes, yes. Uh, very good. So the question is, was this vernal pool historical or was it created? And how did we decide to create a vernal pool here? Um, so this was, so as I said, there were vernal pools in uh, the area that is now campus. But the footprint of the campus has completely destroyed all records of vernal pools. This was a mitigation project where we created vernal pools because uh, we act, uh, uh, the, the project was actually to create those faculty housing and in the plan to create faculty housing was a plan to create vernal pools. So the pools were created at the same time as the houses, which means everything was floored, everything was ground zero. And then we put up houses and carved out vernal pools. So the majority of the vernal pool restoration that we've done so far, it consists of taking um, taking a uh, tractor, carving out vernal pools. We know we are we already know we have a clay pan uh, because uh, we've had vernal pools here historically, and we we found it. Um, it's about a, a meter down, and. So we know we have the clay pan and then uh, we have the soils and so we carve out the vernal pool and then we have some remnant vernal pools that we get seed from and then we seed in and, and transplant in um, uh, plants and then weed out the non-natives constantly and then this is entirely uh, well so most of them are entirely rain fed this one it gets a tiny bit of urban runoff but it actually does not harm it there's not um, we did like nitrogen tests and stuff like that, and we found that it was mainly um, fresh water. Um, yeah. So for for the for UCSD, we kind of figure we know that there's a clay pit everywhere. That's kind of all you need, and so what you really need to make is the topography. Um, in Northern California, they uh, you can do some more modeling. You can look at old, um, like Google Earth, you can look at old depressions and landscape, kind of find those footprints. Um, and you can also do like hydraulic modeling of seeing where does the water naturally flow and then just enhance kind of a depression that you see out there. Um, and they also have uh, this super cool, they have a 3D printer uh, of a, like, a, not not just a 3D printer, but like a 3D topography printer. So they put that on the back of a tractor. They program the tractor, and the tractor just like carves out a vertical pool. It's I know it's so that's my dream, that guys. That's my dream is to carve out vertical pool. Um, and and that goes with a lot of modeling of like with the surface hydrology and things like that. So that uh, you can get really technical with it um, if you want to and if you need to. Um, but for us, um, it was it was less. Technical, I will say. Great question. There was another question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, UC Santa Barbara, right next to the coast. So we have a marine. We're built. Um, the soil is a marine terrace, and so that marine terrace is a really thick clay pan. I'm going. I'm going. So. Um. So, we can create these vernal pools, and we have created these vernal pools, and uh, we can also think about well. I described to you kind of how we do it on a basic level, but also like why would we do it when like we don't really know exactly where they were, um, and that they're just like these really tiny systems inside these this housing complex. Um, but I argue there are actually a lot of benefits to having these small ecosystems. So one is their stormwater management. So again, they can um, take up urban runoff, and um, in this particular situation. They were actually designed as a, a flood, uh, flood of mitigation as well. So they do some some pools actually collect a lot more urban runoff um, than other pools, um, but they all have really high native cover. 
Um, you can also get carbon sequestration. So you have all these plants growing um, instead of concrete. And so that takes up carbon dioxide. And again, the benefits are directly um, seen by the, the people living in those houses. You also have a really nice recreational area for them to walk around. Um, and again, you're increasing the biodiversity of um, our urban ecosystem. When we did studies of, uh, so there's um, like 70, at least 70 native species found in these pools, and they are comparable, if not better, um, in native diversity than the remnant vernal pools in the area um, because they're well stewarded by um, the Chico Center. Um, and um, I argue that there's also uh, more opportunities for doing urban restoration um, from the social, um, the human perspective, where we can actually increase the diversity of the people who are um, in, engaged in stewardship and in restoration work. And I think this is really important, uh, which is why I love gardening and I love um, thinking of these projects as, as gardens or as um, project, community projects, uh, because we can really engage the, the faculty members or other community members in the, the work. You can uh, tell people about vernal pools. Not very many people know about vernal pools. And you're like, you have an in your backyard. Um, and kind of get them involved um, appreciating native plants. So we didn't just put a lawn in their backyard. We gave them a vernal pool and you can do education about why um, you get more butterflies, you get more insects, you get more wildlife. And then um, you can also engage pe um, the people who are involved in the work. So um, some of the community members can get involved in the stewardship work. And I think that's really, really important uh, because when we think of kind of conservation, the conservation movement and more traditional like wilderness areas, um, like national parks, uh, those, uh, those spaces have historically not been very accessible or very inclusive to a lot of uh, Americans. Um, so we can just look at one study where um, this is a study of national parks um, and who is visiting national parks. Uh, 90, 98% of park visitors are white Americans. Um, and that has to do, this paper describes more about reasons why, but a lot of it has to do with accessibility. It's like you have to um, drive to these national parks. You have to stay overnight. You have to take vacation days. It's expensive. Um, and the culture, they were designed um, with the kind of um, Western um, colonialism um, kind of view of what wilderness, what a wilderness experience is. And that doesn't necessarily, the way I experience nature or, way, or the way um, uh, Hispanics would experience nature or Native Americans would experience nature um, is very different um, culturally. So not only are historically um, Minorities are not necessarily engaging with nature um, as recreation. They're also not engaging with it professionally. And so we can also see this report where 88% uh, of the people who are in charge of uh, conservation and preservation organizations are white. Um, and when you go to like the presidents and CEOs, um, often a lot of white males and not many females and not many minority um, people. And so I think that is a really uh, uh, something that we do need to address when we're thinking about um, who gets to engage with native plants. Because um, these graphs look very different from um, the demographics of cities. Um, so if you just look at LA, like, wow, the majority of LA are actually minoritized communities. And so that to me is a huge opportunity for why we should do restoration in urban landscape is because we can engage the most amount of people and the most diverse amount of people in restoration if we do it in cities. Um, and that's just like really, really, um, yeah, really great opportunity where like, if you wanna get like restoration involved people and where are people? Over three quarter of the world's population lives in cities. And so if you want people to engage in plants and in restoration work, do it in cities where it's very accessible to people, where they have a connection to the space that they've grown up in. Um, and it's, it's there, right? We have these little pockets of green spaces and we don't, want the, we don't want those pockets of green spaces and we don't want those people to be overlooked. And so that's why I, I really think that um, urban restoration is really, really important.
So that's a little impetus for why we do restoration and, and why I think doing restoration um, it, like around college campuses is really important. Um, it's again, because uh, I get to engage a lot of, with a lot of people. So these are my interns doing some uh, vegetation monitoring with me. You can see the dorms are in the background. Um, doing some seeding, uh, native seeding. Uh, so these are um, with college kids, but also the Cheadle Center works a lot with elementary school um, kids. And this is not my picture, but I love this picture. Um, it's by uh, Andy Lane, who works at the Cheadle Center. And this is uh, little, little kids from a nearby elementary school um, planting plants. And that's literally, like to me, that's diversity planting diversity. Right? It's such a beautiful thing. So, that's why I do what I do. Um, but then as, as an academic researcher, I'm thinking, well, uh, how are we actually going to do this? Like, yes, there are challenges, not just because we're in an urban environment, but because we only have 5% of renewables left. And um, the Cheetah Center has been doing restoration for the past um, almost 40 years now. Um, and what I was really interested in is was asking, well, how are we doing? Uh, is that restoration actually successful? Um, how did how do we do uh, like how did we physically do it and I kind of described how we kind of carve it out um, and it's really we really think of restoration from a western perspective of uh, kind of like a, a, an intervention where we go in once we do our big thing we carve out the landscape we put in plants we weed and then we kind of like let it go um, and that uh, is uh, again a kind of a colonial uh, comes from colonial thinking and so when I'm thinking of uh, if that restoration like does that actually um, does it actually work as a restoration strategy kind of this one and done um, strategy and um, if not then what are other ways that we can think about what restoration means and so kind of the first thing I did as a grad student was to do that survey of all those blue vernal pools that I um, um, showed you on that map before and was looking, so those pools were um, different ages. And so some of them were restored 40 years ago, some of them 30, 10, two years ago. And so I wanted to see if we did that one and done approach, um, did that one and done approach actually have long lasting effects? What happens to these sites over time? What happens to the native plant community over time? What happens to the non-native plant community over time? So here I have, on the x-axis just a time since restoration so older older pools here and then i have non-native percent cover on the y-axis so uh, if if those one and done strategies were successful restoration strategies um you would want this non-native percent cover to stay low right any guess from someone like this <laughs> drum roll please oh my gosh no and so, <laughs> so this is increasing non-native over time you also notice that um, the y-axis is on a log scale. So actually, this is an exponential increase. Um, yeah, yes. And so that was kind of a red flag to me. It's like, OK, what is happening here? Why are these non-native uh, actually re-invading the vernal pool? So we took out the non-native. We did out for like three to five years, planted native. Native cover was also actually pretty high and not necessarily decreasing yet. Um, but we have this increase in non-native covers where they're coming back into the pool. And again, the majority of the non-natives are these um, invasive grasses. So like Italian ryegrass, wild oats, uh, bromus, uh, ripped up brome and things like that. Um, all these non-native European grasses that grow and reproduce really quickly um, and then die every year. And so we can think about, well, why are these pools experiencing re-invasion? And so that is what most of my research is on now is thinking about, okay, what is causing this reinvasion? What's causing an increase in non-native cover? How can we prevent an increase in non-native cover? And uh, how can we actually promote an increase in native cover? And so this also just kind of, uh, when, when I'm thinking of how to answer those questions, uh, a lot of those, um, a lot of the strategies I'm thinking of, again, as an applied scientist, I'm thinking, well, what are strategies that restoration practitioners can use to uh, to to restore um, restore sites? And in from my perspective, what this is really telling me is that 
that one and done restoration effort is not enough. And what you really need is long-term management or long-term stewardship, um, or I think of restoration as restoring the relationship between plants and people. So you're not just going in once and then like leaving it um, to, to go do its thing. You're Once you initiate a restoration, once you say, I'm gonna restore that place, you are committing to a long-term relationship to that site um, and kind of seeing it through and really seeing um, kind of doing adaptive management of saying, okay, if there's an increase in non-natives, then what do we need to do? Um, which of course is a huge investment. Um, and so my research is really thinking about how can we uh, figure out that sweet spot of, if you know that you're gonna have to do long-term management, what are these strategies um, like cost efficient, time efficient strategies that you can kind of do just on a yearly basis with um, limited resources, um, but just to pay attention to the landscape and, and make sure you are actually engaging with it year after year so that you can actually see this um, non-native increase and then hopefully address it. So my research is focusing on um, what are long-term strategies we can use that can really um, maximize the effort that we put in every year. And so the first, uh, eh, or my main experiment, um, oh, sorry, before I go on. So that, that, that spiel was kind of my first chapter in my dissertation. I just published my first paper. So if you want to learn more about it, you want to get into nitty nitty gritty, uh, honestly, I don't really suggest it. But if you want to get into nitty gritty, you can look out that paper. Um, and um, Brent should be able to share these slides with um, anyone. Um, my, I'll also share my contact information. You can um, contact me to learn more. So that's first chapter in the bag. Next chapter of dissertation is really thinking about, okay, what what is this issue of reinvasion? Why are, uh, kind of how are these plants actually, uh, how are these annual grasses invading the landscape? And again, these are annual grasses. So they uh, live fast, die hard, they grow really quickly. They um, put out a lot of seed and then that seed um, really likes these wet conditions of a vernal pool and can grow really quickly again. And year after year, as these plants are growing a lot and then dying every year, uh, what we see is like, what you see here is not just like live uh, grasses. That is, well, it's a little bit dry grass, but there's also just like, mats of dead grass underneath that's that thatch and that thick layer of thatch is not um the vernal pool is not used to having that thick layer of thatch um, on it because again these are non-native grasses and uh what my uh advisor has shown um previously is that that thatch layer um is actually inhibitive to native plants so non-native plants can grow in their own thatch but native plants cannot poke through that thatch layer. And so what you get is a positive feedback where you get these non-native grasses, thatch, seeds in the thatch, their seeds grow, more thatch, on and on and on. And so I really targeted that cycle and said, well, how can we break that cycle um, of that thatch kind of suppressing native germination, causing non-native um, non to proliferate? And so what I designed was an annual summer removal of all the thatch. And my prediction was that that would decrease non-native cover and hopefully increase native cover. Because we're really scraping out that thatch, the idea is to be able to create, open up space where the natives can then come back in. So this is very similar to um, some research to, um, done in Northern California, uh, where they've done uh, uh, grazing. So having cattle actually graze in vernal pools and the cattle actually love the grasses and don't necessarily um, kill the natives, which is great. And also fire. So they've used prescribed fire, um, just um, got, gotten all the grasses, the dry grass and thatch out using fire. If I could interject, if you were attending three, four, five months ago, Stu Weiss, who might be- Oh yeah, I love Stu Weiss. Mm -hmm. Was the one that mentioned that. Yeah. He grazes, removes the grass with grazing and the natives have proliferated. Right, yeah. So Stu Weiss in, in NorCal does a lot of grazing uh, experiments in grasslands and has shown that that actually they, promotes natives. Do they natives. graze at this point or when it's still green? Oh, when it's still green. It's yeah, so you want, when you're grazing, when you're grazing, you want to eat, um, get the cattle to eat the seeds as well. Yeah. yeah. But um, 
as you saw on the map, these vernal pools are in like one acre parcels. So I would like hire like one cow or like do a bonfire in the middle of campus, which is like not really, uh, yeah, couldn't get the liability for that. So uh, what I did was um, during the summer removal um, with hand rakes and really awesome interns. <laughs> so these are really um, small parcels, but this is feasible where a team of us went out every summer um, again, this is designed to um, be easy for practitioners to do. Spring is crazy. So when you're trying to get those seed heads, it, that like constant reading, constant watching is just so stressful. You're trying to do a million other things. So I was like, let's just, let's just uh, skip that. Like do what you need to do in spring. Let all the seed drop, let everything dry. Let the native seed drop as well. What can you do during, during the summer? Because what I'm really targeting is the thatch. I'm not targeting the live um, plants. I'm targeting get, just getting that thatch out is like the first step. And so after everything died, we went in and we raked out that vernal pool. You can see uh, the firm uh, of thatch behind us was like sometimes over, over our knees. Uh, and that's after uh, four years of doing that. <laughs> Every year there's still so much thatch. Um, so we really scraped out all of that thatch trying to open up some space for natives. And um, my, my main prediction was that that would actually decrease non-native species. So how did we do? So we had pools, control pools, where we didn't do anything. We let the thatch stay there. Then we had the thatch removal pools. You know, on the uh, y-axis, you have change in percent cover. So hopefully I want to see a, a, a negative change, so a decrease in non-native um, percent cover. And <laughs> Yeah, there we go. There we go. So that's just major decreases. Um, the more eagle eye money, you might notice that the control plots also had a decrease in the uh, non natives uh, because we did um, our pre assessment in a rainy year, uh, and then it's been four years of drought since then. So everything's kind of died. But um, fancy stats, and the thatch removal actually decreased even more than the control plot. And so that is telling me that my treatment actually caused an even greater, a significant greater decrease in non -aided. So yay, that all that blood, sweat, and tears was worth it in the in the summer. Um, major thanks to all my interns for helping with that. So uh, really, again, targeting that thatch layer, trying to open up niche space, uh, did decrease the amount of non-natives that were able to germinate next the next year. But uh, the goal of that project was not just to take out the non-natives, um, it was actually to restore native habitat. <laughs> um, so the, the next prediction was like, well, if we open up that niche space, will the natives come back? Um, unfortunately, they did not. So native cover uh, also de decreased because of, the, because of the drought, but definitely did not increase. And so that's where I'm um, moving now toward my uh, next experiment. Um, is how can we, what, what's going on with the natives? Um, are there natives in the seed bank, in the soil that are not germinating for some reason? Um, if so, how can we get them to germinate? If not, if they're just like, again, these are degraded pools um, and then also created pools. Um, and so they actually don't necessarily have a seed bank of natives. And so then what natives um, we put in there could matter a lot. And so that's my next experiment is thinking about what can you manipulate about the natives, about your planting palette that can actually maximize your restoration success. Um, you can measure restoration success in various different ways, but if I'm just trying to like increase um, native cover, um, especially in things like drought, um, where we're definitely getting drier and hotter in Santa Barbara, then um, how do we decide what we plant in these pools. And so um, that's another reason why I love coming down south um, here. And I've been um, down more southern to San Diego, where you all um, have a historically drier climate. Um, and so thinking about local adaptation, where um, we have some species like the tar weed that I was collecting today, where we have tar weed in Santa Barbara, we have it here, they have it in San Diego. And I'm really interested in thinking, well, uh, because your tar weed has been growing um, in more in drier climates, how, does it actually have um, adaptation to withstand 
drought conditions better and can it could it grow better in projected drought conditions so Santa Barbara is predicted to become more like San Diego in the next uh, 80 years and so um, if we actually plant uh, if we can find a, a plant that um, can withstand drought conditions then maybe that plant would be useful to use in Santa Barbara restoration if we actually want to um, have a persistent native um, population, right? So like one hypothesis for why the natives are not growing in Santa Barbara is because um, they're adapted to wetter conditions and they're just not able to germinate or grow in, um, our, in our drier, in our drought conditions right now. And so if we really wanna, uh, again, kind of think about long-term success of a vernal pool in Santa Barbara, is it worth it to plant plants in Santa Barbara that we know um, won't be able to withstand more dry conditions? Maybe not. And so maybe it, it could be useful to use plants from more southern, more hot, hotter climates to use in Santa Barbara. And you guys have, so all of the endangered species in Santa Barbara are actually, um, we don't have any endangered species because they were all locally extinct. Um, you guys still have endangered species down here. <laughs> But you guys are also getting hotter, especially in San Diego. Um, if you ever heard of like San Diego Mesa Mint, or even like we don't have any vernal pool fairy shrimp either. Um, and so if we want to actually preserve these endangered species um, from southern places, um, maybe the best candidate for preserving them could be Santa Barbara. So that's kind of the direction that my research is going right now. Um, and again, really thinking about what are these long-term, what, what does restoration mean um, uh, when we're thinking about these systems? And again, really thinking about, well, restoration um, can mean uh, creating a vernal pool in your garden or just a pollinator garden, having native plants in your garden. But that's a really powerful place to do restoration because you're right there. You can engage with it. You know uh, all your hot spots and your cold spots and things like that. And you're watching it uh, every season, if not every day. You're really forming a relationship with the plants in and, and the land surrounding you. And so that's really what I'm moving towards. We're thinking about what does restoration look like? Um, I think it could uh, look like this, where you have houses in the background, burn a pool in, in your backyard, um, and that these are fully functioning ecosystems that has all the native plants. Um, it has other invertebrate and wildlife species. There's a lot of bird watching uh, that you can do right here. Um, but also um, really thinking about restoration uh, with involving you. Um, so making sure that you are out there doing restoration and really just having that relationship with the land. Um, ongoing stewardship, um, I think is really, really valuable. So getting your hands on the land is really important. And uh, that's why one reason why I love gardening uh, and why I love being able to just, just get to know a space, again, form that relationship between plants and people. Um, and then um, that, to me, that is restoration, is just having that relationship with the land. So uh, again, that's my contact information. I'm happy to take questions, but most importantly, if you want to do restoration work in Southern California, let me know because I want to do it with you. <laughs> yeah, ask questions. Absolutely. Yes, I want to come out to you. Curious how you know, like, if it's just somebody's backyard in Long Beach, do they yeah. have a place in? Like, if you're, yeah. you know, because I know today Long Beach was like made a vernal yeah. pool. Yeah, that's so cool. But how, and how do you know if you have yeah. where it won't like absorb in? Yeah, so the question is, um, how do you know you have the right conditions for a vernal pool, especially that clay pan or hard pan? So in Santa Barbara, we have the clay pan, uh, but I mentioned in that lot, um, that concrete is a hard pan. So in San Diego, their hard pan is concrete. So they uh, did, they just have a layer of concrete underneath. Um, and up, I worked in Stanford as well. And uh, you can actually create an impermeable layer. It doesn't have to be a soil layer. So you can just lay plastic down, layers of plastic down, and then fill it with soil, obviously, so that you can get plants growing on top of it. Uh, but yeah, you can create, you can literally create those conditions in your backyard. That was my yeah. question about the picture that you showed with just like the you know um urban concrete are people yeah. just like laying dirt on top of concrete and firming up the sides 
Yeah, you could. Yeah, that that's one strategy. Again, in San Diego, that's kind of what they're doing. Usually, um, so, so in Santa Barbara, we definitely take out the concrete because we know we have a site by underneath. Um, it's more about feas site feasibility, so uh, it might be easier to take out the concrete, put in your own, like dig the hole first, put in a layer of concrete or plastic or whatever, and then fill it so you don't have to burn it like up up high. Um, yeah, that's a that would be a site assessment question though. Yeah. Sorry, this is too technical. Um, huh? My neighbors are convinced I'm the source of all mosquitoes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, so fair, fair, fair. Can you address that? <laughs> yeah, so the question is are vernal pools also mosquito breeding? Oh. Um, no, yeah. It's, yeah, so I've actually never had that problem. Um, there. That's actually one of the first things that I thought about was like, this looks like a mosquito um, breeding ground. Um, and actually, I don't know exactly why, because the reason why vernal pools are really unique and they have unique invertebrate species is because there's no fish in them. So there's no predator, which means there's no predator for mosquitoes either. Um, but I think because there is that, it, it has its own ecosystem. So there are other species that are, are living in there and, and taking up the oxygen and the plants and stuff um, that mosquitoes have not been a problem. Um, yeah. Do you have any other information about that? But yeah, I, I haven't seen that as a problem, so don't let that deter you. Oh my gosh. Because I am native. Oh, wow. Or is it just there? I mean, sometimes it's not like, no, it's not like an attraction to them. And I think also, like, the other conditions where um, this doesn't really have a, an overstory, so all these plants are really small. Um, and so it's not shaded. Um, a lot of these pools are kind of out in the full sun, and I think that mosquitoes yeah. don't like being in full sun. Yeah, so. We do have one question from yes. the, the yeah. chat. It pertained to some of the statistics you were throwing up earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Adela Barnett was saying, was asking, uh, was it the conclusion that minorities do not have enough money to visit parks? Uh, yeah. Is there more to that story? Great question. Yeah. So there's a question about uh, park visitation. So national park visitation is very low for minorities. Um, again, I encourage you to read the whole paper by Weber. Um, uh, and there's actually been several studies on this. But the main thing that they found that correlated with um, lower park attendance was that um, parks are closest to uh, white dominated communities. So it's easier for white people to get to national parks. So they're just farther away than uh, minorities. And then uh, minorities, um, uh, so there is also, so they didn't, they didn't always correlate with minority. They did also correlate with like income. So uh, I, I'm not saying that all minorities are poor people, but there are poor people, or there are poor communities, disadvantaged communities that are, that were the farthest away from um, national parks. Those communities also happen to be made up of ethnic minorities, and so it was also unfeasible for them to like take off vacation, vacation days, have a have a road trip out there um, to go to visit those parks, and they really saw no reason why. It's like, why would I spend my money on that? I'd rather spend my money on having a picnic with all of my relatives um, in the park instead of going off on my own for self reflection in uh, their their land. So yeah, kind of kind of. Conceptions like that, or misconceptions like that. She had a follow-up question. Yeah. Follow-up question was, it seems like that she could, I'll read it. How will the conservation efforts know how important it is to maintain every year? And then she cites an example of a project, local project. Wait, that not... makes, seems like a direct message. Oh, oh okay. So I, I think maybe the question is just generally on, um, so you've established that maintenance proofs thing how do you get that into an enduring mm, okay, uh, yes. something in the community? Yeah, so the, my, I, I'm a huge proponent of long-term restoration, um, even, and people kind of traditionally balk at that. And they're like, what? I, I have to monitor and maintain the long, in the long term. I have to budget for that. And I'm like, no, you get to. You get to have a relationship <laughs> with the land around you. But yes, that is a huge problem. Like the, uh, a major reason why we don't do that, even as researchers, even as like very good hearted restoration practitioners, we just don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't have the funding. 
and we are not trained to write it in our budget. And so now we're like, we are writing this in our budget. We have to have, um, uh, we have to have a long-term monitoring and management plan. Um, but that's also why I'm a huge proponent of community engagement, right? Where it's not just, um, it's not just professionals doing restoration. It's all of us taking care of our house. That habitat means our house. So taking care of our extended house, our extended landscape, involving schools in um, uh, yeah, education, getting school groups out there, getting community groups out there where you are, you are investing in your environment because it takes care of you. So having clean air, having clean water, having recreation, having that connection with the landscape, um, the, the benefits flow both ways. Yeah, are there ideas about that or comments about that? Yeah, in back. I was just going to amplify your message. We're with South Bay Park Life Conservancy, and that's exactly what we're doing, right? It's we're all volunteer led, and it's basically get the community involved, you know, all the way from, you know, the very old people like ourselves to <laughs> younger kids, you know, high yeah. school out there, the AP Environmental Sciences students, yes. um, nature walks, you know, with toddlers, all those things, right? So building a community around habitat restoration. And you see you right, that's, yeah, that's yeah, getting a community involved in restoration, and it's not like we're not asking for free labor again, it's like you get you get, get benefits, yeah, yeah, you get benefits <laughs> out of caring for your environment, you get you get raspberries and blackberries sometimes, too. <laughs> yeah, Miriam, right. do you want to use different colors in the Yes. Yeah. So the question is, did I do uh, did I test the water for certain attributes, or did I look beyond the plant? So I'm a plant ecologist by training, so I focus on the plants, but I also just love vernal pool, so I do a lot of other stuff that I'm not not entirely qualified to do, but I do it anyway. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of water testing. Um, and again, our pools are mainly uh, rain fed. Um, we do get urban runoff in, in the pools, but we did nitrogen tests of them and the nitrogen uh, was not elevated at all. We definitely need to do more more tests um, of really characterizing the community, but vernal pools are freshwater ecosystems. So you need to have that fresh water um, going into the vernal pools, but urban runoff should not deter you from that. Um, and then, doing plant surveys where we found the, the endemic native plants there, and then uh, doing invertebrate surveys um, as well. So I'm also working on a eDNA project, so environmental DNA, where um, it, instead, of, um, instead of looking for individual insects or little tiny things you can barely see um, and trying to like scoop them out and identify them by hand, what you can do is you can take an environmental sample, so like a water sample, there are fragments of DNA that those swimming little creatures have just like sloughed off. And if we can get those fragments out of the water, um, amplify them um, in the lab, and then read the, the sequences, then we can match those fragments to known species genomes. And then we can tell, oh, if, if, we, if we have a fragment matching that genome, then we can say, oh, that, that animal was swimming in the water column. So if you're interested in, in doing more, um, DNA work, let me know too, because that's, uh, we're, we're trying to get that as a, it's supposed to be a rapid assessment method, um, so it's supposed to be a lot more quicker and a lot higher definition of getting on a species level um, of a, as a monitoring program, so that's something I'm working on with the Cheadle Center saying, hey, um, how is your restoration successful, because they, they don't always look at the invertebrate community because it's so hard, and so I'm offering this to them of saying, hey, can we actually develop this annual monitoring um, methodology with eDNA to, to check this and like that. Does that answer your question, Marion? How do you get your plants for the vernal pools? Do you grow them yourself or compost? Yeah, the question is, uh, where do we get the plants for the vernal pools? Um, so the, this is the Tito Center uh, mainly getting uh, all these plants. So we do have some remnant vernal pools. So we collect seed. I, I go out and collect seed locally. Um, and then vernal pool plants in general um, don't really have germination cues. Um, so it's just water is germination cue. So broadcast seeding is, uh, we, we start with broadcast seeding, uh, but then we do have a, the Cheadle Center does have a small nursery where we can grow out um, some uh, larger plants. And so they, they generally 
seed the first year and then transplant for like two or two to three um, years um, after that, just to kind of supplement and see what we can get out there, especially kind of in the surrounding upland. Um, in some of the larger projects, the Cheeto Center has done seed bulking uh, with s, &S Seeds as a, as a local Southern California um, seed bulking company. Um, but what I'm really thinking of in terms of my future research is thinking about is uh, is using local seed actually the best. So sometimes it is, um, but in the case of Santa Barbara, where we really don't have any pristine vernal pools, all of our pools are very degraded. And so the seed availability is very low and the seed quality may not be great. And so that's why I'm kind of looking at um, using seeds from elsewhere that can, if we can see that there are certain traits that we want in seeds from elsewhere, then that might be a reason to use seeds from elsewhere. Yeah. So that was actually what I was going to ask about. So in bringing, you know, native plants from slightly more south areas, are you looking at different species? Like, you know, you mentioned bringing maybe like the rare species from San Diego up Santa Barbara, super cool. Or are you also looking at like plants that would have been native to Santa Barbara, but just like different locally adapted populations? So you're doing right. Better. Yeah, so the, the, the tarweed, the non um that I just collected from here, mm -hmm. we have that in. So right now I've only been experimenting with um, populations of species that we have in Santa Barbara. Uh, doing translocation of new species is a whole other realm that More I need to like psych myself up for yeah. before I can yeah. take down that battle. But yeah, um, yeah, I think both have different opportunities are, and challenges. <laughs> are you going to try and use the tarweed seed that you collected today? Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I've been doing a greenhouse experiment. So I'm not just like throwing it out into the field. <laughs> uh, doing it in a contained space um, just to see, um, um, trying to grow it alongside Santa Barbara um, populations to see if one has higher fitness, just really germinates better, grows faster, or grows longer. And then I, I'm subjecting them to some drought conditions as well to see if um, one of them grows, can survive better in drought. But in containers? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And if anybody has gotten um, Iliacris macrostachia, common spike rust, to germinate, let me know because <laughs> I have not been able to get it to germinate. It is a rhizominous plant and I'm not allowed to dig up rhizomes. Um, so if anybody has success with that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you may want to ask Tracy Drake. She yeah, I'll ask Tracy for sure. Are a lot of a lot of the pools like that with the buildings by around them, or do some have like open? Are there open fields? So just curious about the conditions. Yeah, yeah. So, so this one, uh, I love I love this vernacular because it actually it looks gorgeous. Um, I, it has some of the highest native cover. And um, and it is the smallest parcel, and so this is like as close as it gets to house where it's it's surrounded kind of all all around by by houses. Again, no non-native grasses, um, but they come in various uh various sizes and shapes, and so there's some where there's like four vernal pools in a in a housing complex. There's some where there's twenty vernal pools in uh an uh, open space uh just like a grass on open space and then there's uh our our big north campus open space is i want to say 30 acres um so and the one in the, the grassland is it surrounded by non-native grasses yeah, yeah. non-native plants or? yeah so in all of those it, it, sorry in in all the parcels except for um so in most of the parcels We've only had enough money to do restoration of the vernal pools themselves and not of the grassland. And then in some of the other ones, we did grassland restoration, and that is a whole other kind of world that's super hard. So there's still not native grasses <laughs> out there. Um, so yeah, that's the main uh, threat to, to the vernal pools is the non native grasses. Because especially during drought, when the pools don't fill up as much, that is the sweet spot for non natives to come in. And once the non natives get in, then uh, they the natives can't compete against them. So the natives rely on having a long inundation period. And so when you can track their inundation period, then they can't stand up against the invasive grasses. Yeah. Well, these kind of pools, I guess some of the ones you're talking about are on the 
college campus. So those are private land, and then right. Or uh, well, it's University of California. Oh, it's so that public. public? <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question is: Are these on public land or private land, and therefore, what like, are you getting? You know, funding based on that. Yeah, most of them are public land. So the the Cheadle Center has uh is actually a grant funded organization, and so with like the North Athens Open Space, they have uh, this whole phase of grant writing, raising funds, and that actually actually those grants ran out this year, and so now we're really wondering what it's going to look like next year when there's a lot less weeding and a lot less planting and seeing what happens after that. Um, with the um I mentioned there are some city parks. Um, that are run by the Parks and Rec District, and their their maintenance is just like mowing the paths. Um, and I'm like, can you just keep mowing like <laughs> into the into the vernal holes? Um, so working on that. But yeah, they just mow the path, and they don't have the capacity to do anything. Um, so I'm trying to get like a community volunteer work day going where we just go out there and um and and plant, but very very small. Um, but all the organizations that I work with are so small, very under resourced, and so many opportunities. And mm -hmm. so they manage so many other different parks in the area where they just, I'm super grateful to them because they just let me have free reign on these parks. They're like, yeah, do whatever you want. We're not doing anything with it. And I was like, okay, uh, I'm doing this experiment. But um, yeah, it, it's a resource limited for sure. Well, if that's uh, that's a question, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining on Zoom. Um, and again, my email's up there. So please reach out to me. I know there's a couple of you I've already talked to. I don't have your information, so you gotta you gotta come talk to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you. I was still yeah. see I went I went to Santa Barbara. Oh yeah. Thirty five years ago.